Shana, one thing I really wanted to ask you is we talk a, about a lot of different subjects regarding English on the show, but we focus specifically on pronunciation in our courses. And that was kind of a deliberate decision on my part to really learn about something and just focus on one aspect of the language. It seems like you're the total opposite, that you have courses on everything, you teach everything, you seem like you're an expert on everything. How did that happen? Well, it actually started with just uh, one area. So um, I, as I was building Espresso English and getting more and more people subscribing to my email lessons, not just Brazilians, people were starting to find the website from all over the world, I decided to make a course. But first, I actually decided to ask my subscribers what course they would prefer. So I had three ideas at the time. I had uh, business English, uh, idioms and informal expressions, and phrasal verbs. And so I basically emailed everybody. I presented these three options, and I asked people to vote. And I was almost sure that everybody would vote for idioms and informal expressions because those are some of the most difficult things to learn in English. But to my surprise... Almost everybody wanted business English. And so I said, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll make a business English course. And so I did. Um, and then after that, I said, okay, well, these other ideas are were still pretty strong, even though they didn't get the majority. So let's make an idioms course. And then I just kept on kind of corresponding with my students and those who had taken my courses and those who hadn't yet signed up for a course and asking them, what would you like to learn? What would you like to improve? Um, what would you like to focus on? And one by one, that's how I ended up building courses on almost every uh, skill area of the language. So speaking, listening, grammar, phrasal verbs, pronunciation, collocations. Um, I can't even list them all, but there are 15 of them. <laughs> wow. That's very impressive and so smart. For me, I essentially just taught English privately for years and years, and I noticed that a lot of my students were struggling with the same thing. So then I just ran away for like six months and created a course on pronunciation <laughs> without asking them their opinion. But I do think Much that pronunciation that is really key because one thing I tell my students is most native speakers will not notice tiny grammar mistakes. Um, and if you use the wrong vocabulary word, eh, sometimes it's a problem, but other times, you know, you can still be understood. If you have bad pronunciation, then no matter how advanced your grammar is or how much vocabulary you know, nobody will understand you. Or um, you'll have to be repeating stuff a lot. And Unfortunately, it also gives people a bad impression of your English. So you might actually have a high level, like a C1 or, or B2, C1, upper intermediate advanced level of English on paper. Mm -hmm. But when you open your mouth, if your pronunciation is not clear, then people are going to say, oh, they're probably a beginner or they're probably just pre-intermediate. It just, it just gives uh, the wrong impression. And <clears throat> I, I also am fond of telling people people that your pronunciation does not have to be perfect. It does not have to be identical to an American, but it does have to be clear and understandable. So I still have an accent when I speak Portuguese, but it's my Portuguese is clear and understandable so that Brazilians can understand me. Uh, so the same thing with English. You don't have to be exactly like an American or exactly like um, someone from England if you're studying British English, but it just has to be clear enough, even if there is a small accent uh, that you can be understood and you don't have people looking at you like, ah, oh, I don't think their English is that good just because of the pronunciation. Yes, I cannot agree with you more. Um, I always try to make the difference between um, yes. kind of accent and then mispronunciation. Like if you say a word, but you don't say it exactly how I would say it as an American born and raised in South Carolina, that is totally fine. But if you just say like, zappy zappy, instead of WhatsApp, you're probably going to have some right, problems exactly. speaking to a normal English speaker. <laughs> Most native English speakers are very generous with grammar mistakes. For example, if you say, I get in the bus mm -hmm. instead of I'm getting on the bus, no one is really going to judge you for that. But I think accent discrimination is a real thing, and I see it a lot, and it's unfortunate. 
But yep. but I will say though that, and I'm sure you believe this too, with training and practice and orientation, it is absolutely possible to get better at pronunciation. I had a student who was um, probably in his mid forties. And he actually had a speech impediment in Portuguese. So he had some problems just even in his native language with uh, pronunciation because of issues with his speech. And he said, um, he came to me, he said, mm -hmm. I have problems pronouncing even in my native language. I don't think I can really pronounce English. I said, well, let's see. Well, to be honest, when we started working together, his English was almost unintelligible, impossible to understand. I could not understand a single word, but we worked on it slowly and I got him to pronounce things in, in an exaggerated way, making sure everything was uh, correct and clear. And then I got him to speed it up. And by the time we were done working together, his English wasn't perfect, but it was understandable. And so he went from someone who literally would not be understood at all in English to someone who uh, would be able to communicate. And he had an English speaking uh, manager at the time. And he said, I am able to work with my manager now uh, in English. And so that was definitely great to see. Uh, so if he could do it, um, anyone with enough practice and dedication. And when you practice pronunciation, you have to actually do it, right? You can't just kind of study it on the paper. You have to be repeating and saying the words uh, in order to improve them. Yes. And that ability to be understood is like in the example you just gave, that is literally life changing. Like that will give you so much more confidence. And that's actually kind of how Alexia and I got started. We both, when we were kids, we both had a lisp, which would be lingua presa in Portuguese. And so we both went to speech therapists to have that fixed and when you're learning a foreign language it's kind of the same thing like there's a sound you can't produce yep definitely and think about yeah think about like when someone is learning any new skill um either an athlete with a sport or uh, someone learning how to draw or paint. Think about how many exercises that person has to do in order to master it. So uh, it's not something that uh, from today until next week, you're going to instantly be able to make a perfect TH sound or instantly uh, sound like an American. But over time, with that practice and uh, guidance from a course or from a teacher, you absolutely can get a great um, English accent or uh, very clear pronunciation. Yeah, absolutely. It's totally possible. So Shana, I know you've taught a lot of students from all over the world, but especially a lot of experience with Brazilians. Do you have any like really common trends or mistakes that you see that everyone is making with? Yeah, so I've got three um, that I wanted to share with your listeners. And actually, these are not pronunciation mistakes. These are vocabulary uh, or word usage mistakes. And I know we said earlier that these are actually maybe a little bit less important because you can still be understood. However, if we can fix them, let's fix them, right? So that uh, students sound more natural. So um, <clears throat> yeah, one of them has to do with the idea of, let's say you want to say a sentence like, eu gostaria de conhecer a Espanha. I would like to, and a lot of Brazilians say, I would like to know Spain. So they translate conhecer as no. But when we're talking about going to a country or going to a new place, in English, we typically say visit. I would like to visit Spain or go to. I would like to go to Spain. We don't really use no in terms of visiting a place for the first time like we would in Portuguese. I see that every day. One of the most common questions that I receive in my first yes. class with a student <laughs> is, oh, do you know Brazil? Or I wanted to take classes with you because you know Brazil. Exactly. So for the first time, you visit a place or you go to a place. Now, we can use uh, know a place if you know it very well. So since I lived in Salvador for seven years, I can say I know Salvador very well because that's something where I know it in depth. It's not a first time visit. Um, I know the city of Salvador. I know how to get around by bus. I know uh, where the supermarkets are. Um, so that's a situation where we can use know with um with a place. Now it's different for people, right? Um conhecer uma pessoa. Exactly. Uh 
for the first time, we would use the verb meet. So I'll also see students saying, um, I knew him seven years ago when they want to say, I met him seven years ago. That's I met him for the first time seven years ago. Uh, so when you meet someone uh, for the first exactly. time, we translate conocer as meet or met in the past. And if you want to get to know someone better, conocer alguien mejor, then we often use the expression get to know. So quiero conocer a la mejor. I want to get to know her better. It's kind of an informal phrase, get to know someone, um, but it refers to talking with the person, uh, exchanging ideas, maybe building a bit of a friendship. Um, yeah, get to know someone better. Yeah, get to know. That's a great phrase exactly. to kind of, you're cultivating um, the relationship. Second, uh, yeah. small mistake yeah. is when talking about your college studies, a lot of Brazilians will say something like, I'm graduated in biology or I'm formed in biology. <laughs> They're trying to translate the word uh, formado or graduado. Um, so in English, we typically say something like, I yes. have a degree in biology or even better, I majored in biology. The word major refers to your concentration of studies in college. Um, so instead of translating that, those words, uh, graduated or, or formed, uh, I have a degree in or I majored in. Yes, this is something I see all the time. And I think one of the most difficult things to talk about also for me in Portuguese is talking about your educational yes, background. So what is called graduação in, in Brazil is what we would call um, undergraduate studies. That's your, your basic four-year degree, or um, you can also call that a bachelor's degree. Um, they call that sometimes we just say undergrad undergrad exactly <laughs> to make it even more complicated yeah. yeah we shorten the word and then um you have post graduação which um it, for us postgraduate work is anything after that four year degree so that would be a masters degree or a doctorate um but it is a bit confusing since um yeah like you said the systems aren't perfectly aligned yeah yeah, in general, I tell my students, if talking about education, um, and a lot of my students work in academics, I always recommend keeping it simple. Like I have a bachelor's degree or I have a degree in, that will be a great place to just start the conversation and get the ball rolling rather than saying, like, yes. I have a post degree in, and then a concentration Totally. In. The, uh, the third thing, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, is when Brazilians say, I like to go to the shopping. Um, so the word uh, shopping has been brought from English into Portuguese <laughs> to refer to shopping center, what we usually call in English, the mall. So I often tell people, I like to go to the mall. We don't even really use shopping center that much in English. Like you'll see it in names, right? You know, um, you know, Central Park Shopping Center, but you don't, people don't say, I like to go to the shopping center. People say, let's go to the mall. Exactly. I literally don't think I have ever said shopping center in that context in my life as a native English speaker. Right. And so it's especially confusing because the word shopping is English and it has been, it's used in Portuguese in a different way. Um, but in a native English speaker would say the mall. If we say go shopping, now it's different, right? Go to the shopping is not correct, but go shopping, that's correct to talk about the activity of shopping. And um, that could be exactly. shopping shopping for food, that could be shopping for clothes, that could be uh, shopping for household items. Um, so you can say, I went shopping last Friday. Um, that's perfectly fine, but avoid saying the shopping, go to the shopping. That's just a, a direct translation from Portuguese to English, and it doesn't, it doesn't sound natural, right? Right. I think that is, that's excellent advice, and this is something that can be very problematic in a lot of different cases where Brazilians have borrowed English words. One that always confuses me where I don't understand where it came from or why Brazilians say it. But the word outdoor or billboard. So yes. <laughs> I hear this all the time. It's like I saw an outdoors for this business. And I'm like, yeah, who created that? <laughs> who said that first? That does not make any sense for us at all. 
I mean, I guess it must have come from outdoor advertising, maybe, um, and then just got shortened to outdoor. Um, I can see the connection, but you're right. That's another borrowed word where um, it's completely different in English. It's billboard. Yeah. Yeah. One I'm seeing a lot recently is uh, home office. So students that work remotely or work from home, they just say, I work home office. Ah. I mean, would be understandable, I think, mm -hmm. but that's definitely not the way we would say it. I think we would say I work from home or I work remotely or I work <laughs> from my office at home, mm -hmm. but definitely not I work from home office or I work home office. Yes. Yep. That's another good one. So Shana, I know that you are a busy person, not only teaching English to a good population percentage of the population of the world, but also as a mom. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but do you have any, I don't know, any recommendations or things that you would like to add words of wisdom for our listeners? Sure. So, um, we just briefly touched on a few common uh, mistakes today, but I actually, when I was teaching in classrooms, I made a list of all the mistakes my students were making and uh, kind of how to correct them. Um, and I made a little ebook that's basically about a hundred of the most common errors that Brazilian students tend to make uh, and how to fix them. I actually wrote it in Portuguese. Um, so if anyone's concerned about not understanding, it's written in Portuguese, pardon any mistakes. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to make that available as a, a free download for your listeners. Um, that would be amazing. Yeah. So if they go to espressoenglish.net slash ehos, E-R-R-E-E-R-R-O-S, -E um, then they can find uh, that download and I'll send you a link to this page as well. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll put that in the show notes and that will be easy for everyone to find. That is super helpful because I have wanted to for so long just somehow ex export all of my Skype messages and run some sort of analysis to find the most common mistakes. But it seems like you've already done that for me. So I really appreciate it. I'm sure our listeners will as well. Yeah. And a lot of these are just small things. I would also encourage people not to, again, not to get too negative about your errors or be like, oh, I'm making, you know, 75 of the most hundred, hundred most common errors. You know, it's, it's not to make you feel bad about your English. The goal is, of course, to make these small changes to correct and improve your English so that you can say these things confidently and not be like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm using this word right. But you can be like, no, I know that I'm using this word right because um, I'm aware of the potential error and I know I'm saying it correctly. So the goal is really to um, build your confidence, not to make you feel bad about mistakes because mistakes are natural, right? Any learning anything, especially language, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, so don't let your mistakes get you down, but um, try to one by one uh, learn how to say it correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Mistakes are fundamental to learning. They're the most important part. You have to make them. You have to learn to embrace them and love them. That's part of it. So, Shana, I completely understand why so many students love you because <laughs> you explain things in an extremely simple way. I tend to talk a lot. You're very clear, concise, simple, and really positive. So I know everyone appreciates that, myself included. Thank you. That's what I try to do in my lessons. That's great. That's great. So Shana, where can our listeners find you? Because I know people will be interested in checking out the ebook, but also other courses that you offer. Sure. So my main website is espressoenglish.net. That's espresso with an S, not with an X. That's a common mistake that actually a lot of native English speakers make as well. And you mm -hmm. can also find me very easily on YouTube if you search for Espresso English. Um, I've got a lot of free videos, free tips, um, and you can kind of check out my teaching, hopefully learn a few things. And if you're interested, then sign up for my email tips or join me for a course. Yes. Yes, please do. And I really recommend to all our listeners because... Shana has a wealth of information, just tons of great content. Pretty much any question that all of my students have, you have answered it somewhere on the internet already. 
I doubt that. There are plenty of questions that I have yet to answer. So keep those questions coming because they, they make for good ideas for lessons. Awesome. Exactly. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Shana. It was a pleasure and a real delight to have you on the show. And I hope to have you back sometime. Great, Foster. Thanks a lot. <laughs>